a small but important audience here today and those who are joining us online, um, literally a couple hundreds, and I'm sure by the time we're done, a few thousand. The last Turkine and Tain talks that we did was intended for a tiny audience like this, but then um, something happened, something about 15 minutes before we were about to start, and so we had to expand. And one of the things that we learned um, that we, was quite unexpected was that we had more followers from our neighbors and people in the rest of the world than we had actual Guyanese online. And I think that's a wonderful thing. So this afternoon, I am not going to ignore you online. I'm giving you a special shout out um, this afternoon because um, I know you're there. Last time we had this event, it was a test balloon for us because there was a lot of, we believe, uh, pent up uh, anxiety, pent up questions, pent up energy, and the people really wanted an opportunity to really explore the issues. And so it was really an exploratory kind of an event. But since then, the university has had an opportunity not only to delve into the comments that were made online, but to see the responses of many people who were listening, both at an official level and otherwise, and also to really think through what the key questions uh, is, really, and that is for many people, what happens if there is a rep referendum in its present form and if that referendum should succeed? I think that is a fundamental question at the moment. And then what happens with internal matters, internal relations um, regarding people who are not speaking our language English? Um, who are not English speakers. So this afternoon, we've put together a panel which might seem like an unusual panel for a discussion like this because you expect to see people in military uniform here and people talking about national security, etc. But all of these matters that the panel um, are going to speak about, um, is going to speak about, sorry, um, are important, but they're a little thought about. A couple of weeks ago, I was asked to speak on a, an international radio program about this matter. I didn't want to do it because I am not an expert on borders, security, or anything like that, but it was very interesting that nobody, uh, few people wanted to appear. And because I didn't want Guyana's side of the story to be really unanswered or there, no, there was no contribution from Guyana, I had to think very carefully about what I could say that was going to be credible coming from me and what was going to be factual. And in thinking about that, there are a couple of things that I'd like to leave with you before the panel begins. One, I believe we need to speak directly to our Venezuelan brothers and sisters because they're listening very intently to what we are saying. And uh, we should not assume that they are listening only because they want to turn what we say into disinformation. As a communication specialist myself, I know that people seek information when there's a gap sometimes, and when they're trying to comprehend and understand something. And it may be that our brothers and sisters over there are trying to get a complete picture or to comprehend the situation in which they might soon find themselves, wittingly or unwittingly. And so should, we should remember we're communicating to a very diverse audience with very diverse interests. 
And so these 10 points that I will go through very quickly are not only for those uh, out of the country, but those in the country um, who we would like to speak to. So first of all, we, I hope somebody on the panel will speak to this in more detail, but the fact of the matter is, in before 1600, before 1600, we had a landmass that was not looking or named in the way that it's named now. That's the first thing. We had indigenous peoples on those lands, and those indigenous peoples, many of them are still around, but in any decisions that were made about borders, they were not included at any point in time coming forward or at that point. And so today we have two representatives of the indigenous uh, peoples of our country on our panel, Jean LaRose, and then a youth, uh, Mr. I'll tell you in a second, Mr. Kivon Jeffrey. He's a student from the university and from Maruka to speak to some of those issues. So technically speaking, we inherited, we haven't stolen anything from anybody, we have not bullied anybody for anything, and we inherited a land which we know to be our own. Secondly, we have not considered, I think very significantly, the cost of war on the environment and the cost of conflict on the environment. And this territory that is on the discussion today, and it's the reason for this tension, is very significant not only to Guyana, but significant to the entire planet. It contains, as you will hear from Mrs. Sion Hema, from our Faculty of Earth and Environmental Sciences, which by the way is number five in the world, I have to put in that plug. Um, you will hear from him what the particular effects of wars and crises could be on the environment, but in this particular case, in this particular place, we have the second lung of the world, as I like to call it. And any kinds of degradation, disruption, destruction in that area is going to affect the entire planet in a very significant way. The third thing is that we are dealing with a country that is about four times the physical size of Guyana, four point something, I'm told. And um, one has to wonder, um, they have about seven times the oil reserves that Guyana has already, several times the reserves of gold already, they have this as part of their, their, what the land that they already have. And what one has to really wonder, um, with those resources still in the country, what significance, what good is being told to their people, what explanation is giving to their, given to their people about their, the conditions are there now. And that is not Guyana's fault. And I think that needs to be honestly spoken about in that country. And if you have not done with the resources that you have, things are still not good. If you get something else, what is the guarantee that you'll do better with it? The cost of war is going to be about, I think, more than 60% of the GDP of certainly both countries, which can be that money, <laughs> those resources, will not come to countries in the region, it will not go to the neighbors, our neighbors, because we don't produce arms. So we have to consider very carefully what that kind of funding and that, that kind of money can do to develop both our peoples.
which may be unresolvable and which might lead to re great, greater distress, harm, and destruction. And so this is the reason why today we have named this event, you know, the prepare rather than fear, but really trying to discuss the path to peace. In our view, it is the people of the country that will hopefully finally decide whether they choose to adhere to international law and to be a country that is respectful of the treaties that have been there and it doesn't mean you have to give up your claim. It just means that you are behaving like a responsible, respectful member of the international community. Because if there are rogue states looking on, including other people with borders, contiguous, and other countries, then we have to be worried about if somebody can jump up, any state in the world can jump up and say, guess what, I'm going to do a referendum and I can take the next steps. So this is not a matter of Guyana and, an, and, a, and another country, a neighbor alone. This now becomes a global issue, a matter of international law, a matter of international peace, a matter of environment, a matter that enjoins indigenous peoples and their rights, a matter that uh, can, we believe, be resolved in a different kind of a way. And finally, we believe that there's a wonderful opportunity for these two countries to lead the world in a model, as a model, for how you can resolve something without open destruction and conflict. There are too many wars in the world, way too many. And we believe that this is an opportunity that both countries could and should explore. There is no bipolarity in this problem. But we're seeing it that way because that's what seems to be presented to us. So this afternoon on the panel, we're trying to ensure that there's a different view. All the facets or many of the facets of the problem that we would not normally consider because we're consumed with being, you know, dealing with, you know, the fighting aspects. Um, we have to consider them. So ladies and gentlemen, with those few remarks, I'd like to invite uh, Joely Valentine to introduce the first panelist. Uh, I believe it is Mr. Neville Bissemba to address you. Thank you. And might I remind you, I am still keeping time. So usually I have my little clock going ding dong. I'll still be keeping time, but I think everybody is well schooled in that process um, already. So we should be all right. Joely? Good evening. Mr. Neville Bissember, who speaks both English and French, worked in the Guyana Foreign Service and held the post of Foreign Officer 2, Foreign Service Officer 2, Foreign Service Officer 3, Acting Head of the Legal Division, Director of the Legal Affairs and International Organizations Department, Legal Advisor to the, to the Guyana Permanent Mission, to the United Nations and legal advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the latter from 1993 to 1997. In 1997, he was appointed legal counsel in the Secretariat of the African, Caribbean and Pacific Group of States in, the, in Brussels, Belgium, and served in that post for nine years. In January of 2006, Mr. Bissemba returned to Guyana to take up an appointment as Assistant General Counsel in, Car in the CARICOM Secretariat, and shortly thereafter, he was made Officer in Charge of the Office of the General Counsel. 
Since 2010, he has been an advisor to the Office of the Secretary General up until his retirement in December of 2020, in 2021. <laughs> Please welcome Mr. Bissembe. Thank you, um, Madam Mistress of Ceremonies, uh, Madam BC, for the kind invitation. And I acknowledge my <clears throat> colleagues at the head table. And of course, my head of department, uh, Justice Benjamin, and my other academic colleague, uh, Dr. Corton. So, President Maduro wants to hold a referendum on December 3rd. Can he? Could he? Would he? <laughs> should he? I'm not quite sure which of the questions we should be posing, which is the most appropriate, but the short answer is yes, he can. Venezuela is a sovereign country. He's the elected head of state, and so as long as the Venezuelan constitution and the rules of the National Assembly permit, holding the referendum is in order. In the same way, the government of Guyana convened a special sitting of the parliament to produce a united position across party lines as permitted by our constitution and parliamentary rules and practices. So the problem arises not so much with the referendum per se, but rather with the effects of the referendum, the consequences of the referendum, insofar as they could have extraterritorial implications, not only for us in Guyana, but also for the ongoing court case before the ICJ. So let me at the outset invite you to draw a distinction between the referendum on December the 3rd and its outcome, especially where it has cross-border consequences. In that regard, some of the questions being posed to the Venezuelan populace, and really any Venezuelan national would be hard-pressed not to answer yes to all five. Some of the questions will produce answers that fit into the category of having cross-border consequences, cross-border implications. And for example, uh, question three, which refers to non-recognition of the jurisdiction of the ICJ. At a time when Venezuela has attended the hearings and responded to requests for submission of documentation from the court, thereby submitting itself to the jurisdiction, they're still saying they're not going to respect the court. And question five, of course, which has territorial, constitutional, immigration consequences for Guyana. However, the topic deals with an overview of referendum, so let me, by way of a comparative analysis, show how misguided and illegal this December 3rd referendum is. And I'll use three examples. Uh, the Falkland Islands is the first one. You might remember there was the Falklands War, 1982. It lasted 74 days. I was actually in London doing my master's at the time. A very interesting time. Uh, Argentina basically says the islands are theirs. Matter of fact, they don't even call it the Falklands. They call it the Mal Las Malvinas. The UK, on the other hand, claims it was a crown colony since 1841. And you see throughout a lot, a lot of these territorial issues, we see the one in uh, the Middle East now, our friends, the mother country, the United Kingdom, front and center in a lot of these issues that have now come back to the fore. So uh, after the prolonged uh, conflict, the war, the diplomatic relations broke, eventually they resumed relations and a referendum was held in 2013. And this is the question that was put to the residents of the Falkland Islands. Do you wish the Falkland Islands to retain the current political status as an overseas territory of the United Kingdom? 99% voted yes. 1,518 out of 1,650 voters and it was internationally observed. East Timor, I don't know if some of y'all might you can look it up on the map tonight where it is, is a small island between Indonesia and Australia, 15,000 square kilometers. It's another long protracted dispute between Indonesia and Portugal. They signed an agreement eventually to allow the East Timorese to vote on their future. Once again, the residents were voting in the same territory that was to become East Timor. 78% of the voters opted for independence. There was another outbreak of violence. The UN stepped in to administer the territory. The Australians sent some peacekeepers. Finally, in 2002, 
East Timor became independent. And the most recent, of course, is South Sudan, which was as a result of a civil war in what at the time was Sudan. You know, I went to Sudan in 2003. It was one country. But we had to get permission from the north to go down to the south to talk to the rebels. And this was the conflict between the government in the north and the rebels in the south. Essentially, a referendum was held in 2011. Again, the question was whether the region in the south, which became South Sudan, should remain a part of Sudan or become independent. 98% <laughs> voted yes to independence. And you might wish to know that both referenda were UN supervised. Um, in the current context, I see it's very common for people to draw a parallel between Venezuela and Ukraine. It's fashionable to do that, to compare Russia's illegality in the Ukraine with what is being threatened here. Newsflash. They're fundamentally different situations. Okay, and let me just break that down a little bit. First of all, Venezuela is not Russia. Venezuela is not a superpower with a veto power in the Security Council. Ukraine is not executable. Ukraine was a part of the USSR, historically. Executable is never part of Venezuela, as we know it. Maybe as part of Grand Colombia uh, in the 18th, 19th century, up to the early 19th century, but certainly not with the whole of the Executable as part of Venezuela. The map I saw in 1813, I believe, is just the top part of the Executable was included in Venezuela. Ukraine was part of the USSR as recently as 60 years ago. Importantly, the people living in the Ukraine are of Russian heritage. They speak Russian. They preserve the Russian culture. In contrast, the residents in the Yesukribo are Guyanese. They say, GT to the bone, as, 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 as we would say. And there are only a few Spanish speakers, and those that have recently arrived, are fleeing the economic hardship in Venezuela, and so want nothing to do with President Maduro and his policies. In other words, if you ask them who they want to rule them, you know what the answer would be. The majority of the residents of the Esequibo are Guyanese, not Venezuelan, unlike the people residing in Ukraine who are of Russian origin. Okay? So if you want to decide on the constitution and legal status of the Esequibo, as in Ukraine, you can't be holding a referendum to seek the opinion of people who are living outside of, Ven of Eskabo, who are living in Venezuela, in another country. Did President Putin ask the Russians living in Moscow or St. Petersburg who should manage their affairs in the Donbass region? No. Granted, the referendum he held uh, in Ukraine was a sham, very often at gunpoint, but at least it was held in the territory under question. In our case, President Maduro is holding a referendum outside of the Eskabo region to decide on its fate. This is unprecedented, unheard of. Venezuela is making up international law as it goes down, what I call it annexation by referendum. But then again, they have a history of flouting international law. To conclude, um, Madam VC, there's no precedent of a referendum held in country A, say Venezuela, to determine the legal status of a part of country B, say Guyana, by asking the residents of country A. The examples I give you, Falklands, East Timor, Sudan, all those referenda were held in country. Okay, so going forward, I think the referendum will proceed on December the 3rd. But my sense is the International Court of Justice will decide on provisional measures to tell Venezuela to change the questions with extraterritorial impact, especially with disregarding the jurisdiction of the court and creating the Guyana Executive In a worst case scenario, I heard you talk about the impact of war, um, Madam VC. I hope we don't come to that. Uh, a possible non-confrontational solution is in the making. Again, following the example of Ukraine, let's take the good lessons learned from Ukraine, not the bad one. There's a team of economists led by Lawrence Stripe, a famous Harvard professor, uh, and some of his colleagues. They're arguing a case based on property rights. Um, Donbass, or Esequibo for that matter, is our property. And the annexation would be a violation of sovereignty and our property rights. Their proposal, it needs working, it's a work in progress. Who will administer it? You have to get an international body. Their proposal would be to go after Russia's property similarly. And if you extrapolate from that, you go after Venezuela's property. Russia has about 300 billion assets frozen in foreign banks. 
and they're trying to work out the modality now to access those funds and give it to Ukraine. If it works, it's a work in progress, we can apply that to our situation, and I'm sure Mr. Maduro might come to his senses, but my sense is he will come to his senses even before that because of international pressure from the ICJ and from our friends um, in some of those larger countries. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. I'm sure that uh, Mr. Bissemba will have a much more, uh, a bigger piece more in depth, but this is just to kind of give a, a menu of those things we're interested in. Um, but we think that uh, we keep indicating that a referendum is with the people and perhaps the best course of action is for them to vote no. And if they vote no, they save their president, their country themselves. And we return to what is legal. I continue to call for that. Uh, the next person on the panel is uh, Mr. Kit Nascimento, veteran and an old man of the media. When I don't mean old, like, you know, old, but I mean uh, <laughs> in, in the best sense of the word, um, quite renowned in the country and revered for what he has known, he's done in the country and what he's known as, as a strategist in media. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Joely to introduce him. Mr. Kit, Mr. Kit Nascimento is a public communications consultant and managing director of local company, Public Communications Consultant Limited. He is a former minister in the government of Guyana. He currently holds a position of public communications consultant to the president of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Additionally, Mr. Nascimento sits on the executive of the Private Sector Commission of Guyana. Please welcome him to the podium. Good evening. First, let me congratulate those of you who've taken the time off to be here tonight. It shows that you have an intense interest in your own country and your own country's survival. Second, let me say, yes, I am an old man. I suspect I am the oldest person in this room, unless there's one of you that's older than 91. And I have, over my life in this country, served all, I think, but one of our presidents in one professional capacity or another. I've been asked to talk to you tonight, tonight about the communications involved in this entire issue. Well. This, of course, is a consequence of old age. If you're going to plan a PR campaign for anything, you have to be absolutely clear on your objectives. In this particular case, Our objective is to establish the fact that Estuquibo is part of our country. It's that simple. And does not belong to Venezuela. The next and most important part 
of any communication strategy is to establish who your target audiences are. Who are we speaking to in this matter? Well, first and foremost, of course, we're talking to our own people. And there we have a problem. Because the Venezuelans, because they are the aggressors, because they want to teeth a part of our country, have been talking to their people about this for many, many years. From childhood to the grave, just about every Venezuela has been taught to believe that Esequibo is part of Venezuela. We, on the other hand, simply because we're not the aggressors, have been very complacent about this. We've spent little or no time educating ourselves and our people about the history and consequences of this. But now, it has arrived at a stage where it could lead to an actual confrontation between Venezuela and ourselves. The problem in a PR campaign is the distribution of your message. How do you get that message across to the people who need to hear it? Well, our own people are one of the target audiences. The other, of course, is the Venezuelans themselves. Thirdly, the international community the world which surrounds us, and the countries which have a significant influence on what is happening here now. Who are they? All of the countries in South America. Those especially who are members of the Organization of American States. The Commonwealth countries, of which we are a part. The European countries. North America. The two most important countries of all in this regard are our the United States of America and the United Kingdom. If you have listened to our president's address at the press conference he recently held, he made it very plain that we have pursued every conceivable diplomatic means of addressing those countries and having them line up on our side. There is only one country, for instance, in, Nicaragua, in um, South America, only one, that has expressed support for the Venezuelan position. It's Nicaragua. Every country in the Commonwealth supports us. Every country in Europe supports us, except, of course, Russia and Iran. They, as we speak, are intimately involved in training and financing of the Venezuelan military. There's no question that we 
can enter into war with Venezuela. Because we can't fight a war with Venezuela. Not a military one. They are actually a country four and a half times our size. They have the most powerful military establishment in South America, including even Brazil. They have the most modern weapons of war that any country possesses. So we should not even think about or contemplate the possibility of going to war with Venezuela. What we have to do is to exercise our minds on how we can avoid that. And that is exactly what we are devoting as a country our diplomatic efforts to doing. The president said as much as he can. There are many things that at that level he cannot say with regard to the arrangements we've made to defend ourselves if absolutely necessary. So we know who our target audiences are. We know exactly what the message is we have to convey. And we've set about doing it. I spoke in a commentary for, um, which was broadcast I'm happy to say not only within Guyana, but throughout most of the Caribbean and carried in a number of Caribbean newspapers. And the point I made was simply this, that the Venezuelans, the Venezuelan government is in a state of economic collapse. Maduro is about to enter into an election which, if it were free and fair, he would lose. They have no historical fact on their side, none whatsoever. He's invented this refer referendum to help him win an election but he has painted himself into an untenable position for himself. They are going to say yes to the question as to whether they should take possession of the Esequibo. So what does he do when they say yes? That is the question we are all at every level in government and in every level of our society addressing our minds to what will Maduro do? I'll conclude now for the moment to say this. He will not invade because he cannot sustain an invasion. It is impossible to sustain with the finances that the Venezuelan government is in the financial position to sustain any kind of invasion for any kind of time to take possession of our country. So he will not do that. Let me rest there. Thank you. Thank you, Kit. I didn't realize that you were 91. I think he must get a, a big round of applause for that. That's amazing. Uh, is, are these your glasses? Anyway, somebody's glasses. So um, I just Googled 
military size in the Caribbean, in the Latin America, and got a rank uh, on a particular military website that we can go to. So this is what it says. Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Venezuela, Peru, Chile, Argentina, Ecuador. That's the rank. I think that's, I hope that's correct so that um, we don't make uh, Brazil feel upset with us that we are degrading, downgrading their military might. Um, and also, um, one of the things that is significant to note is that in a country that is really been hard hit by sanctions, etc., over a long period of time, while they might have a count, um, it's the state of the artillery, the state of you know the things they have, what, how well they can repair, what they can buy. Um, we should not also forget that Guyana can buy some things too, but we're not going down that road, right? But the last time I was here, I used the analogy of a slingshot, and people asked me, like, why did you say a slingshot? And I use that analogy very, very, very deliberately, because you look across all of history, um, look across the by all of the biblical books. Uh, there's always a way for a smaller person defending a, a smaller entity defending themselves to do so. And in this case, we choose we choose to do it in a legal, diplomatic way, and we call on our brothers and sisters, and even the president to do the right thing. There's still a way to backpedal or to do this in a way that is not going to be harmful to anyone. The next person on the uh, program, I believe, is um, Joely. I don't have my program. Miss uh, Jean LaRose. I'll ask uh, Joely to um, introduce her. Whose glasses are these? Okay. <laughs> Ms. Jean LaRose is a trailblazing activist in the fight for the protection, preservation, and promotion of the rights of indigenous peoples. Hailing from the community of Santa Rosa in the Maruca subregion, Jean is a descendant of Lo the Locono indigenous nation. She has spent much of her years fighting for the rights of indigenous peoples to be respected. For her work, she has received the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2002. Jean, a trained historian, served as vice chair of the Constitution Reform Commission back in 1999, which was very instrumental in the creation of the Indigenous Peoples Commission and Article 149G of the Constitution of Guyana. Jean currently serves as the executive director of the Amerindian Peoples Association where she plays an integral role in shaping the association's plan to address continuing indigenous rights violations. Please welcome Jean to the podium. Thank you and good evening everyone. Um, I really appreciate being invited to present a few thoughts here at this forum. I've not put any great thought into what I would say, just to perhaps give you a peep into how our people are feeling, what they know, what they do not know about what is currently happening in relation to this issue that has um, been raised by Venezuela. In 1899, we were on the frontier. My colleague here, he is from a village called Kaikan. He is Arikuna. In 2023, we continue to be on the frontier. He is one of the leaders from those communities, and I hope that later on he can share with you what they are experiencing at the moment. 
I am from a village called Santa Rosa in Region 1. And uh, our people from that community has moved between the borders of Venezuela and Guyana, I would say from since time immemorial. If you look at archaeological or archaeological history, our people have been accustomed to moving from one place to the other. But we did not recognize borders. We recognize that there's a river that gets us to one place. We recognize that we have to cross a mountain to get to one place. We recognize that we have to walk a savanna to get to one place. Our people on the frontier, our people on the borders, guess what language they talk? Anybody want to give me a, a, a quick answer? Let's say where Mr. Rudy is from. Anybody want, he's from Kaikan. Can you tell me what language he speaks? All right, here we go. But it's not English, it's the first language that he speaks. It's not Spanish. He speaks, well, it would be a mixture of uh, Akawaiu, I guess, and Arikuna. Right? And that would be the language that would be spoken by our people on the border. Now, what is happening with, and if, if you look at for the north, northwestern Guyana, so this is western Guyana. If you look at northwestern Guyana, who do we have living there? We have the Carinia people. We have the Lokono. The white people call us the Arawak. They call us the Carib. We call ourselves Lokono, the people. What language do we speak? Now, because of certain influences, the language that most of us would talk there would not be Spanish, it would be English. But we still have remnants of our language, and some of us still do practice speaking our traditional languages in those communities on the border. Again, our people have been accustomed to moving, not recognizing political spaces, recognizing that is, this is where our ancestors moved, this is how our, our ancestors um, survived. Now, currently, our people are, are, are scared. Our people are scared because they don't know what is happening. They don't know that a referendum, for example, is about to take place. They don't know what the referendum means. They don't know if the referendum is successful, what will happen. There is a lot of rumor mongering going on. There are some things that are true. How do you pick between the truth and how do you pick between what is being sold that may not be the truth when you are communities that are cut off from, from national life, I would say, when you do not have ready access to a telephone or telephone system or the internet or can go and Google something and find out something, you're in the dark. So you're left to guess as to what the situation may be and you're left to put together in your thoughts what may happen. Some people remember Anne Coco, and I guess you would, you, you'd, you'd remember that too. Anne Coco, which the Venezuelans call Anna Coco, once belonged to Guyana, now it's occupied, right? I was a little child when Anna Coco, Anne Coco, was occupied. And I remember fear at that time. We are living through a time now when our communities, are the younger generation, I fall in that older generation too, the younger generation are now feeling that fear and they're asking questions and they're wondering what to do and they want to move from their communities and they, they want to stock up on food supplies. Our people need answers. Our people need reassurances. Our people need information. Our people need for official them to speak to them, right? Come December 3rd, I'm going back to Santa Rosa, which is my homeland. Some people are running. I'm going back to Santa Rosa. That is where my roots are. That is where my, my home is. I want to encourage our people. Stay in your homes. That's, that is what you own. Stay on your lands. That is what you own. That is what the, the patrimony of your ancestors, of your forefathers. Stay. Guard it. Thank you.
Thank you. So she saved us 2.50 minutes. <laughs> so I uh, made up for some people, some other people. Thank you. But um, I think the point that you are making, which is one that in any situation like this, you'd have anxiety and, and on both sides. I don't believe that we should um, not, we should forget that the people living on the borders on the other side are also um, likely to be fleeing. Um, anytime you have conflict, you people will flee because they're concerned for their safety. And this is one of the points I was making earlier that if you have displacement, everybody who is a neighbor who's contiguous and has a border has to be concerned because you have people fleeing across in any direction they can and that, of course, can cause some serious disruptions to other territories. So Brazil has to be concerned if something is going to happen. Colombia, for sure, um, and others who are nearby. Um, and I would like to echo the call for people to not abandon their patrimony. It's a difficult thing for me to say because I'm in town. And um, it still um, is something that is a personal choice. But um, I believe the analysis is from every, every angle that I can speak about that the probability is fairly low. It's not zero, but it's low. And I'm not going to sit here and lie to you if I thought it was otherwise or if I'd heard otherwise. Um, but one never knows. Next person on the panel is um, a young man from Mar uh, Maruka, Mr. Kivon Jeffrey. Um, Joely, please introduce him. Mr. Kivon Jeffrey is a 26-year-old final year student pursuing a bachelor's degree in education at the University of Guyana. A native of Warapoka, village Maruka, sub-region, region one, his village has a population of 600 residents and mostly comprises the Warao nation. Wakapoka, Warapoka is well known for its rich ecotourism potential. Kevon is the holder of an associate's degree in education Specializing in secondary training, specializing in secondary training from the Cyril Potter College of Education, having started his teaching career in 2016 as a TQM class three teacher. Please welcome Kevon Jeffrey. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Um, first, I must say thank for the invitation. Um, firstly, I'm the youth from Muruka, Warpoka village. This afternoon, I came here with uh, much emotion. I'm sad deep within, deep within me to see and to see what is happening to my fellow brothers and sisters in my hometown, Warpoko. Warpoko is situated at the border, very close to the border, and it brings sad within to see what the people there are experiencing at the moment. First, they are living in fear. It, it's a trauma that is happening to them at the moment. They, they don't go about as the normal activity because we depend heavily on fishing, farming, and so. The people there, they, they are not free to move about. They are thinking about the war. Firstly, they, in there we don't have no, um, when it comes to the referendum, when we talk about the referendum, the, we the indigenous people there, we don't have idea what the referendum is about there. And when it comes to communication and so, we don't have the communication access there. So it really breaks my heart to know that we don't 
even know what is the referendum referring to. When I when I talk about when I think about this war here, what it ponder my mind to talk about what can happen if there is a war about our land and resources. Our people heavily depend upon farming as well. Um, the cultural practices, what can happen to our cultural practices, you know, as a youth there in Morocco, I'm thinking about if there is a war break, break out. Um, I rely upon my ancestors to, to equip me with the knowledge they have there. But if, if there is a war break out, I will say, though, what is happening, you know, to, um, I will not be able to gain that knowledge from my grandparents and so. The people in Morocco as well, the, in my village, I could talk specifically because of the border. Um, they are thinking about, now they are thinking about the, what, what can be done. They are thinking about their, their, their rights being violated. They are, you know, they are thinking about moving. Some of them are, right currently, some of them are moving to Georgetown to seek safety. And some of them are moving more dense in the forest. For my community, we, we, we go and hunt further. So that brings a, a, a thinking to them. Now they want to move further and to, to seek safety. And the other thing they are they're thinking about is the most people in my community in Morocco, they are employed by the government, like CSOs, the SIP workers, and so. Um, you know, I, I, when I do the research and I find out about the, what is happening there inside the community, um, they are thinking about what can happen on the 3rd of December. They start to gather, um, you know, food that can serve them throughout the process. They are thinking about where they would get the finance and the money to, um, if there is a breakout of the war. Um, so they are requesting that if the, the government can, you know, at least um, pay their salary before the 3rd of December. Um, With that being said, um, there, when I talk about their cultural practices, their, the cultural practices, they, they talk about what can happen to these, these historical sites in our community if there is a breakout of the war. These things we treasure a lot in our community, in our places there. Um, like the, the, the cave, and the, we have shell monks there as well, and if there is any breakout, all of this can cause damage to these to these sites that we treasure a lot. Um, our human rights are being violated. With this being said, I would thank you for listening and I'll over to another speaker. There will be no war. There will be no war. There might be conflict, but there will be no war. You need to manifest this, and we hope you will be able to send some of the information we have through your, your, your WhatsApp and so on with your people to explain what is going on now that you have this information. I want to thank you for coming. There will be no war. We have to hold on to that and work towards that. And this is on both sides. I keep saying this. This is not about us alone. This is not about two countries. This is a very complex thing. Brandon Chong is the next person on our panel. Joely, please introduce him.
Mr. Brandon Chung is a project consultant specializing in international development and migration research. His work has included various international organization for migration projects, that is with the UN Migration Agency, for member states in Eastern and the Horn of Africa around diaspora engagement and labor mobility. Brandon serves as a fellow in the, United, in the University of Guyana's International Center for Migration and Diaspora Studies and holds a graduate degree in Latin American and Caribbean Studies and International Development Studies from the University of Guelph. Having remigrated to Guyana in 2022, his professional interests now also lie within the country's medium scale gold mining sector. Please welcome Brandon to the podium. Thank you. Good evening. Um, all protocols observed, uh, reflecting on what the Vice Chancellor has said this evening, uh, this issue is a nuanced and complex one. And it is my personal hope that throughout this, both domestically here and across the border, that cooler heads all around will prevail. So where uh, do I stand on this issue as a, as a minor? Uh, our operation is based in Mausi, uh, which is on the other side of the Essequibo uh, within the territory that, that Venezuela disputes. And while we are not uh, at the border, I would say that you know, if we were to ask how is this affecting uh, economic activity and mining, uh, this did not start in September. Uh, those who are familiar with uh, the mining sector, as well as in other economic areas, most likely, like tourism, uh, there has been for some time now a chilling effect on economic activity uh, on the frontier. Um, and this has been ongoing uh, since probably prior to 2015, when the Maduro administration uh, began to reassert these claims with the discovery of oil and gas offshore. Now with that, um, I would like to clarify that the, this chilling effect has not just come um, from the ongoing uh, territorial dispute, uh, but instead the mining industry, second only to our indigenous communities, has borne the brunt of criminal activity emerging on the uh, Venezuelan side of the border uh, as it relates to the now infamous crime syndicate, which has seen the majority of major legal mining operations uh, move away uh, from their work uh, in, in those areas. Now, speaking to some of the more pragmatic considerations that I have had a chance to reflect on in preparation for this forum, um, I would draw attention to the fact that we are currently here in Guyana experiencing a labor shortage uh, during our economic boom. The Foreign Affairs Ministry, via the person of the Foreign Secretary, has indicated we are short approximately 100,000 persons for the economy to meet its basic labor needs. And while there has been a shift in economic activity that has seen Guyana, believe it or not, be classified as a uh, high or upper middle income to developed country, these conditions have not yet facilitated 
any meaningful return by the one million or so Guyanese who are abroad, um, nor has any sort of significant migrant worker program emerged due to a variety of political considerations which limit labor mobility uh, or a migrant worker program. We all know from living in Guyana that the influx of Guyanese Venezuelans as well as Venezuelans has assuaged some of these uh, pressures of the labor shortage. And I would like to emphasize my point, Guyanese Venezuelans, many Venezuelans who would have returned to Guyana either as first, second, or even up to third generation, fleeing the economic circumstances in that country and returning here after many years abroad. So all this to say, we should be probably while not neglecting border security or defending our sovereignty, uh, we should be considerate of the economic implications of those who have come to Guyana. The uh, recent statements by a variety of mining associations um, that are prominent have called for support from government in addressing some of the labor issues that the mining sector is currently facing due to the construction and oil and gas boom in the coastal land. So not only are there physical bodies filling these roles uh, coming from Venezuela, Venezuela, but also in my personal experience, I have seen that these migrants um, are hardworking, they bring skills. Um, we, some of us may know, in eastern Venezuela, in communities like Santa Helena and El Dorado, gold mining is, as it is with many of our hinterland areas, uh, the primary economic activity. And so, what I have witnessed is that indeed, many of these uh, economic migrants, Guyanese Venezuelans and Venezuelans, uh, possess a variety of skills and firsthand in skills regarding the recovery of gold, which in Guyana we are not very good at. There is no doubt that we must safeguard the patrimony of this country. At the same time, there are some very real human socioeconomic considerations that we must remember. Um, could I borrow your program? The theme uh, of this talk was prepare rather than fear, a path to peace. So with that being said, I have in the last few weeks, as all, of this has, as, all, as all of this has occurred, I have witnessed firsthand uh, some of our um, gravest impulses in dealing with these persons. I have lived 20 years outside of this country, uh, not in Venezuela, I lived in Canada. And so I am intimately familiar with being othered and being an outsider in my host society. In the last two weeks, I have had incidents of workers, persons who are formally registered here. They are either Guyanese Venezuelans who have returned uh, or they are Venezuelans who are registered with the Ministry of Home Affairs um, as migrants. Um, I have seen them be harassed in public, guns pulled on them. I have, had, I have heard stories about their children being bullied in school, um, a five-year-old girl being told to get out of her seat the Essequibo is ours, and so this chair is mine. 
I have heard of a 15-year-old boy who is the grandchild of one of my staff members um, being asked at soccer practice if he is a part of some vanguard that will establish a beachhead to wage war and eliminate us. These are Venezuelans and Guyanese Venezuelans, but these are children. These are innocents. And so I would appeal to our deepest sense of humanity as a people who have been displaced previously to keep this in mind as we choose our words publicly, especially around children. The implications of this are not just territory, patrimony, gold, and oil, but there are real human lives uh, in Guyana, Guyanese and non-Guyanese, who are deeply affected by this. And I believe that we can appeal to the international community, defend our border uh, and our sovereignty uh, without revorting to these most horrendous of impulses as we do so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Balance is a wonderful thing. And while we do agree that we have to be as humane as possible while balancing the need for internal national security and stability, there also is the flip side of what is might be happening to Guyanese in Venezuela now, what might be happening between communities um, of people who are not speaking uh, English. We don't know, people don't walk around saying I am this, from this nation. And this is a very big uh, problem because we can't just assume um, anything. And the other uh, impulse that we have to guard against in this context is to read things that are interpersonal that might be occurring anyway in the context of the conflict. So it is a very complex uh, thing, and especially interpersonal thing, but um, we need to remember all of those parts of it as well. And I think that the question of having uh, the migration policy and the registration of, of, of everybody who is here um, is something that is very significant and important for us to um, focus on. I know it's happening, um, and it's not that it's not happening, but we really have to insist that we have a regularized uh, system that is transparent, and, um, and it, it will take the tensions down. The other thing is that we have to consider that these rising tensions in the interper in the in the local pop amongst the local populations of all peoples is being triggered by what is being projected and what is being said um, by people who are um, aggressive <laughs> aggressive towards um, our country and our people, and so it's not something that is we're not xenophobic by nature. Um, but this is all part of the horrible mix of conflict which we should be seeking on all sides to avoid. The final speaker this afternoon is uh, Sion Hema from the Faculty of Earth and Environmental Sciences. And did I say it's number five in the world? Yes. Joely, please introduce him. Mr. Sion Hamer currently serves as the head of the Department of Environmental Sciences at the University of Guyana. He obtained a diploma in forestry from the University of Guyana in 2007 and a Bachelor of Science in Forestry in 2009. Presently, he, he is enrolled in the PhD in Biodiversity Program at the University of Guyana. As a dedicated researcher, he has contributed to multiple fields of study, including agriculture, climate change, ecology, biodiversity, forestry, and environmental management. Collaborative efforts include partnerships with organizations such as 
EPA Guyana, World Wildlife Fund Guyanas, the Food and Agriculture Association of the United Nations, FAO Guyana, and NARI. He maintains collaborative relationships with various government ministries and agencies. Please welcome Mr. Hamer to the podium. Good evening, everybody. Um, with all protocols observed, we heard about the various ramifications of a possible conflict or the thought of a possible conflict. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so we, with all protocols observed, we heard about the various aspects of um, the thought of a conflict and we're hoping that it doesn't happen on our borders over our Essequibo, which spans over 63,000 square miles, which is our biggest county in Guyana. Now, my task is to present the environmental ramifications of conflicts on our border. And our border here in Guyana is fast. We have borders with Suriname to the east, um, to the south, southwest, and also the south the southeast we have brazil and to our immediate west there's venezuela which is the point of contention now we are in a unique situation here in guyana right now with a possible conflict or the thought of a conflict brewing brewing on the northeastern borders of our country and if you're a student of history History would have taught you that with conflicts comes not only economic and social strife, but also environmental strife, as we could see with many unfortunate um, events happening in places like Vietnam during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and the neighbor, their neighbors, Laos, Cambodia, and so on, were negatively um, affected by these conflicts or these unfortunate events. And one of the things that is triggered by conflicts would be mass migration. And Guyana is already receiving some sort of mass migration right now, with people fleeing from geo geopolitical events in Venezuela and coming to Guyana hoping for a better life. But with mass migration, there is an environmental consideration that we have to keep in mind. Because when people come to Guyana, some of them would be registered, some would be unregistered. And these people, when they come, they would be in survival mode. And survival mode would make people do some crazy things. And uh, so when they, when they come to Guyana, they're looking for that better life. They come with literally nothing, just their two long arms. So they would now start to, the first thing they would start to do is look for a place to live. And I've seen with my own eyes, right in the Escobar region, even as, as close as Region 3, they would come in looking for a place to live, they would start to um, squat and, and so on. Right? And in squatting, in some instances, they would start to um, devegetate areas to put up some semblance of a, like something like a shanty tongue so that they would live in or they would start or they would attempt to live in areas where they know that they can find employment easy. And the environmental ramifications of this is that our um, unique ecosystems within the Essequibo regions could be significantly disturbed. For example, deforestation. Deforestation is one of the common things that would happen and probably already happening, but it is not on a scale that we would notice at the moment, but in due time, it might happen. And the next thing, coming from deforestation, a lot, of, a lot of the biodiversity would start to disappear because the habitats would be destroyed. And in turn, the habitats being destroyed, the intricate hydrological systems in our equable, that would also be disturbed through contamination and so on because when we set up these um, squatting areas, when they set up these squatting areas, what would happen is that they would have to 
set up some kind of sanita sanitation facility. And in many cases, as you would see in any squatting area, the waste that would come from the community that is set up would go directly into, into the waterway, right? And this would cause a form of pollution. And these actions are not only critical for Guyana as a country to recognize uh, for a na as a national problem, right? But also it's, um, it has ramifications internationally because since Guyana is, um, has one of the, the largest forests in the world, largest contiguous forests in the world, it is also known as the lungs of the earth. Uh, because we have a part of the Amazon rainforest, right? So we are part of the Amazon basin and also at large the Guyana Shield. And also one of the main, re the main functions of this forest is to sequester large amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which helps to regulate the climate and gives us some, uh, gives us some of these nice conditions that we're accustomed to year-round, although the weather has not been treating us nice for the last couple of months because we're in, we're in, a, in a, an El Nino cycle, which is predicted to last until January. And this, this phenomenon also puts pressure on the ecosystem because we're going to have things like fires breaking out and so on. And in addition to that, these same migrants that are coming in looking to eco to live in an eco to place to live, they would start, they would use fire as one of their means to, you know, like make a meal or something. Or something. And in many cases in these con the present or the prevailing conditions, these fires would get out of control. And it would start from a small fire. It would end up to one hectare, two hectares, and so on. And when these things happen, we re emit all these sequestered carbon into the atmosphere. And now instead of we're trying to, instead of we're having the effect of regulating the climate, Right, we are now emitting CO2 into the atmosphere, which we are trying to get out of the atmosphere in the first place. In addition, so this would have ramifications not only for Guyana but globally, because in extension, the global climate system would be disrupted. Right, because this would be a, I want to say, a significant part of the Amazon basin would be disrupted. And also the hydrological systems would also be significantly disrupted and we would also be losing our soil resources and so on. So in conclusion, I just want to say that we not also consider the economic and the social part, but also the environmental part of a potential conflict or a thought of conflict on our borders here in Guyana, which could spread from the borders to the inner parts of our country as well. Thank you. Thank you. In other words, from any angle you look at this, not a good idea. So now, ladies and gentlemen, the part that many of you have been waiting for, which is the question and answer part of the program. Do we have a roving mic? Right. This one? Oh, no, this is the y'all thing. Okay. Right. So we have a roving mic. So let me just put down the ground rules again, just in case. So we take three, three questions from one side, so you don't have to walk back and forth, then a three from the other side. If there are any questions online, we take three. And then depending on how long and involved the answers are, we take another round. Okay? So we are going to start this side because I saw this person's hand, somebody's hand up first. One there. Two. All right. One, two, and three, and four. Okay, two here and two here for now. Um, go ahead, please. And um, if you can, please direct your questions to someone in particular if, if you want them to answer so that we can be um, efficient. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chair, before I ask a question, I just wanted to say some news. Um, released 
not too long ago, U.S. State Department, joint statement of the 2023 Caribbean-U.S. High-Level Security Cooperation Dialogue. Office of the Spokesperson, U.S. The text of the following statement was released by the Government of the United States, Caribbean Community CARICOM, and Government of the Dominican Republic on the occasion of the 11th Ministerial Meeting of the Caribbean-U.S. High-Level Security Cooperation Dialogue under the auspices of the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative. I'm just going to use um, quote one part of the text. We, the governments of the Caribbean and the United States, have gathered to reaffirm our commitment to the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative Partnership, launched on 27 May 2010 at the inaugural Caribbean United States Security Cooperation Dialogue in Washington, D.C. And it goes on to speak, it's a long thing, but it's uh, among the um, declarations. Uphold the, our partnership through the CBSI to advance our shared goals and reaffirm the breadth of Caribbean U.S. security cooperation and engagement, including long-standing cooperation on core CBS, CBSI issues, including maritime law enforcement, firearms trafficking, border, and port security. I just thought, I, and it goes on, but I just thought I would, I would share that. It was released at um, 1.52 Eastern Standard Time. U.S. was going to be in two something here. Um, but my question is, uh, I see there's a tendency to um, try to play down the, the question of war. Now, war can take several forms. It doesn't have to be military um, in the true sense. And I think it is always best to, um, you know, deal with the future by anticipating it. And I know that from people who have had experience in dealing with Mr. Maduro, for instance, one Matthew William, who was Grenada's ambassador to, the, um, to, to Venezuela some time ago at a forum in Florida, made it clear that his knowledge and his interactions with Mr. Maduro, even before he was president, was a, someone that was very unpredictable. Um, Ms. Rangel, who used to be the um, chief of staff to President Carlos Andrews Perez, has said that Mr. Maduro is prone to military action. His only um, uh, restraint is the fact that he might not enjoy the full um, support of his, of, the entire, of his entire military. So I think it's important that Indeed, that we you know look for peace, but by the same time, um, I think our peace could only be guaranteed to strength, and that is where our diplomatic efforts must be strengthened. To and I think at the last forum, I, I, I raised the question of some form of a multinational um, border protection force, peacekeeping force, um, as a as a means of strength. So, my question though is to the young man from, and, and, and uh, Ms. Lurose, uh, any of them can answer it. You talked about um, your people not necessarily recognizing borders, but you recognize rivers and mountains and plateaus. Um, what is the position, though, of your people about the land that they occupy? Do they see it as as Guyana's land? Definitely. Um, our indigenous peoples who reside within the borders of what we know as Guyana, what we call Guyana, what we recognize as Guyana, see ourselves as Guyanese. We see ourselves as Guyanese, and we also see ourselves as indigenous peoples. So yes, we do move, we do move around, but we are Guyanese. And that is, what, that is why we are concerned. That is why we want uh, our borders to remain intact. We want our homes to remain intact. This is our home. This is what we're talking about. So yes.
unusual, but I have a question for you, Mr. Curtin. So that statement that you just read, the release that came out at 1.25 this afternoon, do you perceive it as a, a statement of support for our actions um, and our case? An explicit statement, I mean. Well, I've had some experience in diplomacy, and particularly public diplomacy. And um, sometimes messages are sent in various forms, but um, in my view, yes. I think it's a, it's a, um, a timely declaration. Um, while not making any specific references to, to any situation or any country, I'm sure it's not going to go unnoticed, um, particularly in the light that the United States has said to Venezuela that unless it does certain things domestic um, in terms of keeping, in keeping with some pledges made about domestic political um, activity that would seek to, infer, to ensure free and fair elections in the future, they will be enforcing sanctions if those conditions weren't met by the end of November. My hope is that on the 3rd of December when those, as I know, those conditions are not going to be met. Well, hardly likely, I don't say I don't know. Hardly likely those conditions are going to be met by Mr. Maduro. And I would hope on the very day of the referendum, the United States would announce the, the re-imposition of sanctions on Venezuela. Hmm, but those are two separate things some would say. However, thank you. Uh, the next question, please. First, I'd like to say enough respect to all of us who are wear the DMS, which is a military show. Secondly, I want to say that some of the things that I've said here, I'm hopeful that the general staff will have access to the depths of that information, so in the calculations in relation to the potentiality of war, they place weights where it's supposed to. Tonight I have learned of the instability of the president of Venezuela. I did not know that. But my good friend articulated that, and I'm hopeful that the general staff will pay extra weight to that, especially if he has a proclivity for military action as it perceived, as was perceived. I just want to say those two comments. Thanks. Uh, just to be clear, I didn't hear anybody say that the gentleman was unstable. They said he was unpredictable. You were saying something, but we don't, from this panel, nobody said so. Um, and unpredictability is not instability. We have some psychologists, and so I'm one myself. I don't want us to be saying stuff that is not fair and respectful. Unpredictability can be a strategy as well. So don't let us say things like that. Um, but thank you for your consideration and your comment. Uh, the, you you want to say something? Yes, I know you said that, and I want to make sure that that is uh, the, the record is properly uh, maintained. The next person, please. Thank you. Good things to you all. Good night. Uh, I got two questions, one to Mr. Kitnasimento and the other to the head table anyone can answer. Mr. Nascimento, I figure out you're the only person here that may be a representation of the government as an information liaison. Am I correct? Yes. Well, I don't know about the only person. I know I am. <laughs> I'm going to get straight to my question. My question is patriotism. And I, I'm asking this question because I'm not seeing it from the government. And I'm very serious about it. Because we have politicians running around this place, and it's not a political question. It's about patriotism. Because this is how you arouse a nation to defend itself. I, I hail from an area called Sophia. And most of the young afro guyanese or Negro boys or Aboriginals, I may call them, are saying three things. I ain't got no land because they're taking it away from me. I don't have a work because they can't find work for me. And plus, I ain't got money. So what am I defending? And I'm very serious about this question because that is what is out there to the head table. 
1960, the United Nations passed a declaration, it's called 1514, where it says all colonial powers must give back the lands to the indigenous people. The thing is that from since then to now, all superpowers have broken all laws of the United Nations, whether it's declarations, whether it's, whether, whether, whether it's a, a, a submission, whether it's the United, United Nations Assembly or, or Security Council have met, they have broken all these laws. Maduro or Venezuela is no guarantee because if his vice president can stand up at the ICJ and says, whether or not we don't like it, the, the referendum will proceed, I don't know what is on their mind. My question is, are we prepared for that particular action is going to take place on the third? Thank you very much. That's a good question. And the answer is, we are preparing as much as we can. If you mean, are we prepared to take on the military might of Venezuela, the answer is we cannot do that without um, significant international support and assistance. I am not in a position to tell you, and if I was, I wouldn't tell you anyway, the degree of support we are receiving from the governments that could help us defend ourselves. But if you listen carefully to what the President said in his address to the nation at the recent press conference, he made it pretty clear that he is confident, I think he used the words, that when push come to shove, Venezuela will get no support internationally, and we are likely to get all of it. That's the best answer I can give you. Now, if you're talking about patriotism in terms of the population, whether you're Indian or African descent or like me from Madeira or indigenous, Guyana belongs to all of us. And we are all, I think, equally interested in keeping it that way. And the Estequibo is part of Guyana. Uh, I just wanted to say three things here. Um, that sentiment is around because we're seeing it um, about you know what is the value of of that kind of connection to a country that might not be giving you what you deserve or you think you have. So that is a real comment, a real sentiment, and I think we need to address it because my staff showed me something this afternoon, I was quite appalled uh, that's circulating on social media from a medical doctor, somebody who is a medical person who is expressing the same thing. Um, so it's not only um, amongst one section of the, of the population, we have to accept that and interrogate that for ourselves. That is an internal issue that we need to fix and I don't think we should not address it and, and, and really acknowledge it, right? But that's also happening in Venezuela. That sentiment is also there because there's still, there, there are millions of people who have exactly the same hardships that they face and have similar problems with land, with this and that. So it's not only on our side. I'm talking about balance. With regard to the, um, the, the security issues, I think that um, it should not be assumed that 
what you don't see does not exist. Just let me simply say that. It should not be assumed that what you don't see does not exist. Because nowadays, if you, are, if you really look at what, how conflicts and, and the kinds of artillery and so on, that I, well, I'm not using the right word, machinery and so on, are used, they're small things. They're not big things that you have to cut down trees to do and so. They're small things, drones, this and that. And, and I'm not saying that, that, I'm not saying anything that you don't know that's not in the public domain. So um, we also have to uh, think about all of that and what the difference between Guyana's position as, as a country that has access to, to, to wealth now, right, funds to do things as against how many years ago. So there, there, there are things that could, could happen. But we choose, we choose not to go down that path. It will not be good for any one of the two countries and none of the neighbors. It will not be good. And if we think that at this point in time, we don't have resources to give to everybody what they should have, when you have to deploy resources to fight, and in a war, it's going to be worse on both sides. So I think we really do need to focus on peace. And Leslie, Wesley, focusing on peace does not mean that you're not preparing for any eventuality. It's just that this particular panel is not the slingshot panel. <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you. Next, yes. Yeah, thanks. Um, just briefly on the, on the referendum, um, I, if I thought I had said it. I don't, I don't think the ICJ has any authority to tell any country they can't hold a referendum. What they have the authority to do is tell the court that if, tell the country that if the referendum has international consequences, then they need to take account of that. It's something about the interference in the internal affairs of states which the United Nations will be the last entity in the world to do. All right, Mr. Maduro has a constitution. He's a duly elected president, regardless of what you say about the nature of the elections, he's been elected. If he wants to hold a referendum, fine. The government of Guyana call a sitting of the parliament, fine. It's the consequences of the referendum. I believe I heard the Attorney General say so on the steps of the ICJ that what Guyana is asking the court is not to stop the referendum, but it's the questions that are being asked. I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, the judges are serious, conscientious, qualified, excellent jurists. We should let them do their work, but the provisional measures, the way how it works, because it's urgent and what we're asking cannot be uh, reversed easily, they have a duty to come back before the referendum on December the 3rd and hand down the provisional measures. My estimation, based on my little bit of knowledge about international law, is that they will say the referendum can go ahead, but not with the questions how they word it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, let me endorse that. We have not approached the ICJ to ask them to tell Venezuela not to hold a referendum. That is not what we've done. What we have done is to approach the ICJ to tell Venezuela that if they hold a referendum with a loaded question which promotes the annexation of another country they would be in violation of international law. It's an important distinction. Be careful when you interpret what ambassadors have to say. One interpretation of what the ambassador had to say could be that we're not going to invade because we own the country, so it belongs to us. We're not invading anything. Be careful when you seek to interpret what ambassadors have to say. I will withdraw it. However, I am repeating what was in the national press. 
that was what was reported, but I will take your caution. Uh, you, you have your hand, oh, uh, Ms. Cole has her, has her thing, and then this gentleman in front here, and there's some comments in the back. Uh, thank you very much. Russia was telling the entire world that they were not going to be invading Ukraine. We observe the shoring up of the troops, and as a social scientist, you observe behavior. They told the world that they were not going to invade until the 23rd of February 2021. The war started. I have observed the Venezuelan vice president lying. I can say that to the ICJ that we are the aggressors. I mean, we don't even have a war tank, so how are we the aggressors? right? And saying that we are targeting Venezuelans. How are we targeting Venezuelans when on our own police vehicles? Up to recently, we had policia. We're including them. Um, something is not right. And here is where Mr. December, uh, as a person versed in international law, CARICOM appears to be torn between two lovers. And uh, on one side, they put out a statement, but then we hear an individual leaders speaking with forked tongues. That is a bit worrying to me. How do we ensure that we have solidarity across borders? Mr. Kit Nascimento, you served under Forbes Burnham. What is different now from then when he was able to mobilize locally, regionally, and internationally, when he would say, we have friends. Do we have friends? How prepared are we? Ms. LaRose, I count over 30 planes flying over my home every day. Something is happening within the indigenous communities. People are leaving. Behavior tells you that something is happening. We must pay attention to the behavior when the head of the army will order all soldiers not to fly and rescind their vacation, it tells you something. Again, how prepared are we? And I want to express solidarity with the indigenous peoples who are right there up front and center where all this is happening. Something has got to happen that reassures us. I am very scared. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm supposed to be taking an international course. I'm dropping out of it because I want to be sought. I, I just want to tune into what is happening. This region may not be a zone of peace. Now we have the Barbados PM t warning, telling Guyana that we must what? Be a zone of peace. It is not us who are the aggressors. The aggressors have always been Venezuela. From the time they took Ancoco, and Mr. Bessembe, you talk about taking Ancoco. It doesn't mean that the SUK could not be taken. This is the harsh reality of what we're facing. We can wake up one day and find that the peace that we enjoy is gone forever. And I want to use my, my very indigenous brother. Yes, Mr. Kidnassiman, could you please advocate for the payment, the early payment to those indigenous people so they can stock up on food? If you are paying attention and you're looking at behavior, you will ensure you have food in your home. Because in the time of war, look, if we look at currently what is happening right now as we speak, the misery in Gaza, then we know that Guyana can face that. I am worried. I am very, very worried for this nation. And I am worried that our leaders are not making us feel secure. I feel very insecure as a citizen of Guyana. I thank you. Let me, just, let me just say a couple of things quickly. Um, and I started out at this point, and I'll say it again. Venezuela is not Russia. Russia is a superpower. It's, a, it's one of the P5 members of the Security Council. Venezuela doesn't have that authority that if, for, for instance, we need a Security Council resolution to give Venezuela an instruction or something. Venezuela doesn't sit on the council. They don't have the veto power. They will have to get somebody on the council to either abstain or block it. That's the first thing. Mr. If you ask the Russians, 
You know, Mr. Nasimeto talk about not believing everything or interpreting an ambassador. The very night that uh, the Security Council was meeting in New York, I believe it's February the 22nd, well, with the time difference, to debate what was going on in Ukraine. The invasion had already started. But if you ask the Russians, they would tell you that they didn't invade uh, Ukraine. Mr. Putin got his lawyers to find a formulation. They said it was a special military operation. There was no declaration of war. There was no invasion. So the laws of war were not triggered. Treaties weren't suspended. A whole range of things resulted as a result of that position that Russia took. Secondly, in explaining what they did, you know what the Russians said? Which Mr. Maduro, with the greatest of respect, cannot stay in the context of a Sikubu. The Russians said, get this, they were exercising the right of self-defense for the Russians who were living in Ukraine who were being disadvantaged and discriminated against by the Ukraine government. There's nobody, no group of people living in the Asikibo right now that Mr. Maduro is saying, yes, I come in and exercise the right to self-defense on their behalf. I'm saying it, I, I don't know, I could sing it if you want. The two things are not similar, okay? Secondly, you mentioned something about forked tongues. I didn't hear anybody speak with any forked tongue. I heard a prime minister of a country who has concerns about guaranteeing her supplies of oil, who was trying to look after her national interests as best she could. These things bring down governments, eh? Things like flour, gasoline, the basic uh, essentials. Um, and so, Miss Motley, and I know the lady personally, she has a domestic constituency to speak to. Likewise, Mr. Gonzalez, who I know also from my previous, uh, my previous life in, in, in CARICOM diplomacy, who has a relationship with uh, Mr. Maduro for on a number of levels, ideological, political, a number of levels. Um, and so those people, those distinguished prime ministers, have to be careful at a time like this. I don't think anybody's saying they're not supporting Guyana. Basically, they're trying to walk a thin line. And we have done it in the past too. I've seen, uh, I've been in meetings two, three, four years ago on the Palestinian issue where you could not get a consensus because the issue is so heavily politically or otherwise charged. Right? And so, um, not because you hear somebody not saying what you want. You know, there's something about quiet diplomacy. Okay, and I was saying to the VC uh, yesterday, I think, even if you look at the security aspect, the military will tell you about need to know. You don't need to know everything. I would bet my bottom dollar that there's a lot of quiet diplomacy going on in this matter. The back channel communication, people talking to one another. Look, I don't know if you've seen out of the, 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 the meeting with um, President Xi and President Biden, they have reintroduced a back channel, not a back channel, a front channel for the military commanders to start talking directly again, just like they had done in the Cuban Missile Crisis. That was one of the things that came out of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Finally, let me say that if you're talking about what forked tongues or whatever, the European Union took a decision to stop buying oil from Russia. Okay? It's a European position. The Germans said, um, hello, our economy depends on Russian oil. I think the Poland said the same thing. The great industrial might of Germany depends on supplies of Russian oil. So they said, we're sorry. We can't go along with this uh, embargo. So what? The European Union give them a blight. They give them a pass. So there's still a European Union decision that says oil must not be bought from Russia. But they made an exception, an opt-out for Germany and Poland. If you transpose that position now to the Caribbean community, there will be people within the community, just like Germany and Poland, who have their national interests to protect. 
And we should allow these people the diplomatic space to do that before using language like forked tongues and so on. Thank you. I think we're making some fatal mistakes in drawing parallels between what's happening in Ukraine and what's happening here. There are no parallels to be drawn. They're entirely different situations with different histories and different interests. I can also assure you that President Ali, Gonzales, and Motley I like that. They are very close personal friends. They talk to each other every day. They are on the same platform where it comes to the violation of international law and interference across each other's borders. You need have no concern for that. But Motley has her own constituency at home. So does Charles. There are many audiences that you target and many different messages to different audiences. But in the final analysis, the day after Motley spoke and appeared to, as you put it, speak with folk tongues, she wasn't. She was speaking to two different audiences. The Barbadian ambassador made the strongest possible statement at the OAS council meeting defending Guyana. Strongest possible statement. There was no doubt that every CARICOM country stands alongside Guyana on this, without any question. And believe nothing else. Okay, so if you look on your program, you'll see a website that the university has, um, has created. It's in a little box that says the number of things that UG is doing around this. We've put a lot of those statements, we're curating and collecting a lot of the material around this, is this question there so that you can easily get it, not what's unnecessarily on social media. So just pointing that out for people who want to read those communiques, who have missed them, etc. Uh, the two people on, on online, and we'll come back to the audience in a minute, the, the live audience. Go ahead. So the first question from our Zoom audience comes from Mr. Mark Sinclair, and he asked Ms. LaRose, his question is, how can Amerindians who cross over the borders provide more information to the relevant authorities on the Venezuelan army movement? How can more information to the relevant authorities on the Venezuelan army movement. And the second question comes, yes. All right, um, that's a very difficult question. Um, how can they provide information? Um, Information pass both ways all the time. In, 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 in times before situation, well, it, I think the dream has been there a long time ago, but it's become more in the forefront. Information has been passing, and information continue to pass. That's all I, I would say. How, how they pass it. <laughs> I don't know, information just passed. Um, and and there, there, is, there, there are telephones. They may be tapped. You may be bugged, but information can, can pass all the time, you know? Um, what I do know is that uh, movement on the river is restricted, physical movement. I do know that um, there is movement within our clo closed border of non Guyanese moving there as well. And uh, um, 
as was pointed out by the person representing the mining um, interests, you have had the syndicatos making life not the easiest for people. How do we know that information is being passed? That's all I would say. Thank you. The second question from uh, online. Okay, you want kids? Okay, sorry. Go ahead. We don't have to rely on uh, indigenous people crossing borders to give us information, believe me or not. We have satellite information. We have zones that are watching everything that happens in Venezuela every minute of the day. Be confident of that. Okay, next question. A second question also comes from Zoom and it's from Alicia Baker, Alicia Barker. And she asks, with the prowess of Russia and Iran with potential nuclear power supporting Venezuela, how can we truly reassure Guyanese that Venezuela would not declare war having the support they have? With the prowess of Russia and Iran with potential nuclear power supporting Venezuela, how can we truly reassure Guyanese that Venezuela would not declare war having the support that they have? This is from Ms. Alicia Barker. I can answer that. If Russia and Iran got involved in this matter publicly, you can guarantee that the United States of America would be in it the next day alongside of us, which is exactly why they wouldn't. What I want to say is that we work on all levels to ensure that all bases are covered. But there are no guarantees, I believe, that uh, somebody will not do something stupid. But it probably will not last for a long time if they do. But we are working with the same unpredictable person who could turn around tomorrow and say, guess what, I am, I've changed my mind or I'm doing something else, right? Um, no, it is possible. It is quite possible. Um, but we cannot ever say that something will not happen. When I put my arm around that young man and said there will be no war, I was trying to get him to manifest in his heart and to get us to think past what could be a very anxious time about what we can do and how we can address this because any kind of uncertainty does produce anxiety. It doesn't matter what type it is. And certainly one like this will. So I can't sit here and say with absolute certainty what, uh, that it won't, but I think, I think we should not think the worst. Maybe that's the worst, the best I can say. So we have one more round of, um, one more round of questions. You had this young man here, you had this gentleman here, and then Dr. Curtin, the last round. Go ahead. Oh, one second, uh, Neville wants to say something. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here, thanks. I'm sitting here, look, I, the reason why I didn't say anything, and I still don't, because I don't understand the question from Miss Baker or Barker, or whoever it is. Um, because you put it in the context of nuclear weapons. Um, we are friends with nuclear weapons, okay? I don't know if the question is premised on the fact that because Venezuela is a friend to Russia and Russia has nuclear weapons, if there's a war, they would use nuclear weapons here because that is, we must just take that off the table. If you're saying that Venezuela has a powerful friend that has nuclear weapons, and as we say in the vernacular, they get them little spunks. Well, we have friends with nuclear weapons too. And the final thing I will say, you know, people need to understand some of these things, the interconnectivity of diplomacy and international relations. If Mr. Putin with his nuclear weapons did not use nuclear weapons in Ukraine, you really believe our neighbor to the West can get him to send a nuclear 
Okay, um, come please. Yes, sir. I know from little to nothing about international diplomacy. Mr. Mr. Bisemba, you are rather optimistic that there would not be a war. I defer to your optimism considering uh, your experience in international diplomacy. However, I am sufficiently aware to conclude that a war has begun, at least ideologically, psychologically. If a very good one of the, the more enlightened women in our society can confess to this forum that she is fearful, then a war has begun psychologically. If people from the border are driven to the coast, then a war has begun, at least psychologically. Secondly, we talked about uh, there not being any invasion. I prefer to use the terminology incursion. While there may not be a physical invasion, there is an incursion on the sovereign state that is called Guyana by virtue of Venezuela's quasi-annexation of Guayana Esequiba to its map. So there is some measure of incursion on national sovereignty. So I'm not too confident about there not being any war and any incursion. As a matter of fact, it behoves us all to prepare the citizenry by while, tell, while encouraging us not to think of the worst, to prepare for the eventuality that doesn't favor us. We don't want a war, a physical warfare, but in the event that there should be an onset of warfare, what can we do? And so my question to this panel, after all these talks, are the actions connected to these talks? Mr. Nascimento, I noticed how you very expertly avoided the question of patriotism. Word on the street is, in a, con in a country of resource bounty, there is deepening poverty. Affect, afflicting the masses. And so, to what must citizens of this country be patriotic? To a country that facilitates their deepening poverty? And that is a real thing. Some people saying, me? Me ain't going to put me life on any line for any country that doesn't respect me. And as somebody pointed out, the government hasn't been saying anything uh, to inspire confidence in the nation that there is sufficient uh, attention paid to that imminent uh, activity that doesn't look in our favor. So there are all these things. I, I would like for you to comment on, 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 on what I've put forth and to answer, to properly address the question of patriotism, what the government has done or intends to do to inspire a sense of patriotism. My friend, I can only be an optimist and nothing more in the current circumstances. Okay? Um, Mr. Nascimento gave us a listing that who's the, the biggest army. I think the VC had another listing. We didn't feature on that list. All right? And from the time I started in the world of work, I know that in this country, diplomacy is the first line of defense. We have no choice as small developing countries. Um, you said it's war. I said it's aggression. It's a fundamental difference in the laws of war between war and aggression. Okay? It has different consequences. Different things are triggered in a war as opposed to economic aggression or psychological aggression or, or whatever. Um, you used a the term there, my friend, that is alien to me, quasi-annexation. I don't even know what that means, but fine. You say you're not a, no, no, it's fine. I'm not, I mean, you say you're not a student of international relations, but I understand what you're saying. 
You know, today when I was preparing for the um, this, this thing, uh, I remember some people were saying, I've heard them say that in the Guyana Constitution, it includes, there's a definition of Guyana which says Guyana uh, constitutes the country that was just before the, the enactment of the Constitution, right? Guyana as we know it. And people seem to think that that gives them cause for comfort. Well, <laughs> there was a Constitution amendment, I think in 2014, to the Argentinian Constitution. And that Constitution says the Malvinas Islands is part of a province of their country. So what? A constitution has effect within the borders of a country. So the Argentinians could put it in their constitution that the Malvinas is part of Argentina, just as we put it in the constitution that the, the Guyana constitutes the map as we currently know it. That's for our national purposes. But if you listen to the noise out there, again, Mr. Nascimento says we must be careful how we interpret what the ambassador said. I've seen statements from two Venezuelan ambassadors, including the one here that says there will be no invasion. Now somebody put a spin on that and say, yeah, they're not invading. It's their own anyhow. Well, if it is theirs and they're not invading, why go through the charade of having a referendum? Why they just don't invade? The referendum, which the ambassador himself said is an internal matter, wouldn't give them anything different if, as they're claiming and as some people are saying, Esikibo already belongs to them, which of course is nonsense. There are international maps that have been drawn for decades that show the Esikibo as ours. And people need to know these things. You know, Mr. Nascimento was here the other day and he's saying we must, you know, use the bumper stickers and so on. It's not a blade of grass. Mr. Dave Martin was here the other day. People need to know why we're not giving up a blade of grass. People need to know how come the Esikibo is ours. Putting the bumper sticker is one, on the car is one thing, but the background, they must know that for 60 years, our friends in Venezuela accepted the map as we know it from 1905. They signed an agreement. They signed a map saying this is the official map. And then what happened? They found a letter from a dead man. A letter from a dead man who made it quite clear that this letter mustn't be opened until he dies. And from that, I quite simply say, dead men tell no tales. And there's been no other snippet, no other document of evidentiary value other than that letter from that gentleman, Mr. Mallet Provost, who was a Spanish-American and who had just received a national honor from Venezuela shortly before he wrote the letter. And on that matter, I rest, but I'm saying there's no other evidence. There's something called state practice, the practice of states. When Venezuela, the day after the non, no confidence motion, when they run that drill ship out, Mr. Greenwich, as foreign minister, went to the parliament and made a public statement. The statements you see President Ali making are public statements. Or what Minister Tad did, those are public statements by government officials which constitute something called state practice. And there's a wealth of evidence on the Venezuelan side from their state officials upholding the map as we know it. You should know in that case before the court, when they were trying to decide in the Jarsum Agreement, in the Geneva Agreement, sorry, who should determine the matter if the parties couldn't agree? It is our friends Look, people need to know these things, eh? It is our friends on the Venezuelan side who insisted that the Secretary General must be given the right to choose. The same person now, the same office as it was, eh? not the person, the Secretary General, the Office of Secretary General. The same Office of Secretary General now that they're disrespecting and say he did not have the right to choose the means of settlement. When the thing was being negotiated, there was an option of referring it to an international organization. And our friends in Venezuela said, no, 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 no. They want the Secretary General to choose. You fast forward now, we've seen a different situation. There's a whole weight of body of evidence going in the other direction. So people need to know the truth. And if you want to justify what you're doing now on the basis of things that are not 
It's fantasy. That is fine. But all these terms you're using about quasi annexation and war and so on, there's no basis in the history or the legal background, the legal antecedents for us to arrive. That is why I am an optimist. Because if you sit down and try to rationalize these things, the wealth of evidence is in our favor, my friend, and that's why I'm an optimist. Why do you think that Venezuela will never recognize the ICJ? Because they know that they are wrong. Because they know that they are in violation of international law. That is why they are fearful of an ICJ ruling because it will go against them. This is not, as my friend here said, a new issue. It's 100 years old. A hundred years ago, Venezuela recognized these borders. And they never raised a word against it until we were on the verge of receiving independence. They were then able to persuade the Kennedy government in the US and the Macmillan government, led government in the UK, that Guyana was going to become independent under a communist government. So, the Americans and the British at that time had entirely different interests. That is what led to the Geneva Agreement. And that is why Mr. Burnham, when we became independent, entered into the Geneva Agreement in order to guarantee, one, we would get independence, and two, that the borders after independence would already be defined clearly and unequivocally. All the Geneva Agreement has done is to set out a lengthy means of discussion about what is already fact. And at the end of the day, the Secretary General of the UN has said enough is enough. You talked enough. It's all failed. Time to have it settled under the Geneva Agreement judiciary. Judici Judiciously. I always have problems with that word. And that's where we are today. Now as for patriotism, you know, it doesn't matter which government is in office, the PPP or the PNC or any other. It's still Guyana and it's still our country. And that is why there is no difference whatsoever between the opposition and the government at this point in time. None whatsoever. And you will always find that regardless of whichever governments or parties are in office. They will always hold one position if the nation itself is threatened externally. And any Guyanese who calls himself a Guyanese doesn't believe he has a duty and a responsibility to defend his country, for me, simply isn't a patriot. And I would have no time for him or her. 
That's my answer to that. Mr. Nassimento, I just have a question and a comment. First is, I think that there's, there ought to be a more aggressive public sensitization program. Thank you. Thank you. I, I am of the view that there is work going, and I compliment the University of Guyana for this kind of forum. Some work at the, at the very high levels must be ongoing today. But at the level of the people, they don't seem to be in the loop. And therefore, I would publicly recommend immediate introduction of a very strong, aggressive, public sensitization program. I don't know if it's your agency or which one is the, would be responsible for it. But that would be my humble view and opinion that there is a dearth of literature, a dearth of information that has not yet trickled down, but that is not available to the mass of our population. And therefore, I, I, I ask for it to be done immediately, if not sooner. Secondly, a question. I wonder how, how you'd respond to the view that, indeed, in this Caribbean, in CARICOM, this clear and present danger facing Guyana is unprecedented. We have the fourth pillar of CARICOM being security. Security for states, all member states. How would you react to the view that before December 3rd, there should be a meeting of CARICOM heads with the only item on the agenda being yes. Guyana, this existential threat, and the need for unequivocal, unwavering support for this state in that particular forum. Yes. So there, there, are two, there are two. All right, let me respond to your last one. Yeah. Though it wasn't given specific publicity, that meeting took place in Abu Dhabi. That's where it took place. Every Carrick comrade was there. And they all met. But I'm saying there was no specific release or publicity that it took place. But the Caribbean CARICOM heads are talking to each other every day. And they all say, share the same position. But it's not an unreasonable suggestion that they have a special meeting and give it a lot of publicity. I think that may make some sense and one worth considering. But I can tell you that in Abu Dhabi, where they all were, they all met and they all had bilateral discussions on this matter. And they all share exactly the same position in Saudi Arabia yeah. insofar as the PR campaign is concerned as I said earlier on from a long time now we were complacent about this but I think you're being a little unfair these two documents have been produced. They have had extremely wide circulation across the country. Their content was published in centipede spreads in all of our newspapers uh, a week ago. In every single newspaper there was a centipede spread with these, this information in it. These documents set out the history involved uh, in some considerable detail. On top of that, I know that the government is in the midst of preparing a video information, information on this. 
They're preparing animated cartoons on it. They are currently in the process of a PR outreach, outreach in all our frontier communities. By that I mean that a number of our ministers are about to go into the frontier and meet on direct uh, meetings with the population on our frontiers. We are translating, as, we, as I speak, all of these documents into five Amerindian languages, into Spanish and Portuguese. This documentation is available in every one of our diplomatic missions and is being distributed widely. It is being distributed to all of the countries in the Organization of American States. On social media, all of the material in these documents is now being distributed. On TikTok, on Facebook, on all of the social media platforms. This is actually taking place. So it's not fair to say that there is not a major PR campaign that has already been started. It is in fact taking place. Thank you. Are you done? Okay. So um, this gentleman in the front row here has had his One, uh, Forgive me, Chairman. And I hope you'll all demonstrate your individual patriotism before leaving here, pick up one of these, and I look forward to seeing it on the bumpers, stickers of every one of your cars. Okay. So, um, gentleman in front row, thank you. Go ahead. Yes, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm happy that we have some very strong people in front of us here, especially Mr. Kit Nascimento. Um, I'm not afraid, just like you, but not everybody doesn't have that. We're all human beings, and we all have some kind of fear at this time. I am a full Guyanese, and I, it's a clue that belongs to me, personally. I believe in that very strongly. Um, I just want to share with you where I belong. I'm from Kaikan. The river separates us between Venezuela and Kaikan. That's my village. You can swim if you're a fast swimmer within two minutes across Venezuela. You understand? And what we observed there, I, I only came to Georgetown about three days ago. I was to return today, but I believe God said, you have to say something tonight. Yes. There's something good going tonight. And I'm grateful for that. That I can have clear understanding from you all here. I got it very clear, especially from this gentleman, which I never understood before. I'm very grateful about that. However, my village is situated like this. There is a military outpost in Kaikan. The school building is very close to this base. It's like about a uh, hundred meter from the school. It's close to the military base. So this is why we are very much concerned and we have a very good team tonight. Prepare rather than fear. It's very clear to me. And I believe at the end of this session, we should have some kind of recommendation. What should we do to prepare? In the event that this cruel guy, Mad, we call him Mad Duru. He's a mad man. I believe strongly indeed he cannot do anything 
You know why? The soldiers at this time, across the border where I'm living, they are starving. They have no food to eat. How can he war? I guess Guyanese who have a lot to eat every day. I believe he cannot make it. Even though that's the case. Even though that's the case. As human beings, we have fear. So there is something that we should do as citizens. And I believe that's the reason why we're here. To share our concern. Okay? And this is what I believe we should do. You feel secure because you're on the coast. You're in Georgetown. No, no, no. I am saying, I say, you may, feel, you may feel more secure than I am because I'm in the jungle. I'm at the border. I don't feel secure. You know why? Presently, across the border, what I'm talking about, there are over 500 troops which came in recently from, from the capital. There is a general at this time in that outpost, a general commander. And there are about over 500 troops. And in Kaikan, there is only 11 soldiers. 11. What can they do? So, I believe, I, I don't want no other soldiers from other country. I want my soldiers. I want Guyanese troops yes. to prepare at least in the event that this madman do something. At least we must have troops. Guyanese soldiers I'm talking about. We're not depending on CARICOM and Russia or you know, these countries. I want to see my own Armenian soldiers so that we can feel more secure that, okay, we have these guys protecting us. But there, there, there must be like, you know, at least... I'm just suggesting maybe a hundred rather than eleven, yes. you know, so that we can feel more secure. And we have a very good airport there at Kaikan, very good airstrip, and that they can these people can take advantage over it very easily, very very easily. Can, can I ask you something? Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Maduro, one of the questions, the question five is that if you agree to the creation of this Guyana Esikubo and for the people who have been living there to be given Venezuelan ID cards. If he is sincere about that, apparently you have nothing to fear. He's not coming to do you know, violence or anything. From what he is saying, he's going to take care of you. So you can rest assured, my friend here says I'm an optimist. There's another reason to be optimistic, because if in the unlikely event something were to happen, and we're talking about war and this and that, it's not that kind of war. The gentleman will come and welcome you with open arms and give you a Venezuelan ID, and he say we'll take care of y'all. I don't know how that is going to happen if the majority of the people who are coming across the border are here as economic migrants, fleeing the economic hardship. If you're running from a country, we can't think about it. Would you want that person to take care of you? But that is what the question says. Would you agree to the creation of this new state and they will take care of you? So there's another reason for you to be uh, optimistic. But let me ask a question generally. I, there's some video circulating today, I think, about, and the person said, Kaituma busy, four aircraft on the ground. I don't know when that video was taken. I don't know how busy Port Kaituma Army is. What does that mean if four aircraft are on the ground? Huh? Is that yesterday? Yes. Yeah, because I'm wondering where these people are going. If in fact they're leaving, where are they going? I don't know, they all have relatives in town. You obviously travel up and down. Um, I don't know when they reach to Google, then where are they going? All right. Uh, so, I, one second, Jim. he was not finished, right? Yes, so, so that's, that's my uh, remarks. That, that's the fear we have indeed as human beings, but uh, we need more security in the border. Not only in Kaikan, 
along the borders. I think that's what we should do as citizens of Guyana. Thank you very much. I, I, Thank you for look, your uh, contribution. Thank you. Um, I, I very much appreciate your remarks. And indeed, there is reason to be concerned. I don't think fear is the right word, but concern is the right word. Of course, there's reason to be concerned. What we are doing, and as, it, as far as educating the average Guyanese, I don't think there's a single Guyanese at this point in time alive in this country who does not know that Venezuela is after grabbing two-thirds of our country. Every Guyanese knows that now. And what every Guyanese needs to understand is why. And the why is that 60% of the wealth of our country is in the Esequiba River region. That is the why. And the Esequiba region gives the right out to sea to access to oil and gas because that's included in the border. That is also why. Maduro is not interested in, in any of the land there. That is not his interest. His interest is grabbing the wealth that is in that land. And our interest is to defend it by every means at our disposal and which we are certainly doing. We cannot, at the highest level in our country, reveal every single detail of how that is being done for obvious security reasons. But I thought and I refer back to it again, if you read and understand and listen to what the President had to say at that press conference, read between the lines. Read between the lines. Okay. And there's not a single country except Nicaragua in our hemisphere that has not stood up and said Venezuela has no right to the Esequiba. Everyone has. And the most powerful country in our hemisphere, the United States of America, has made it very plain indeed that they're 100% behind Guyana's position on this. Very plain. So yes, there is reason for concern, but no, there's no reason to give in to that concern. Thank you. Okay. Um, a couple of things I want to say um, before we, we have to wrap up because we are like a half an hour over time. I did prepare though when I, before I came here, I'm going to take the last two questions. Before I came, I did prepare a 10 point uh, preparedness plan for people on the ground, an individual plan that you could make um, just in case you need to, to, to activate it. And it also helps to manage that anxiety. If you know that you're, you're likely to do X, Y, Z, you have a plan. So um, when I am, just before we wrap up, wrap up, I will read it and I will also circulate it. And we're also um, creating um, uh, a, a voiceover for it, for an, an animation for it. Um, so just so you know that sitting here and saying to you that this is something that I do not believe um, is a, a, a short-term eventuality is not 
that we don't feel anxiety. I just want you to know that. But if you are going to lead and if you are going to get past fear, the brain works like this. The, cent the part of the brain that, that any information reaches first reacts with emotion. And that's where, how you get fear. And then if you can get past that by thinking through or having a plan or so on, then you're able to act and move. So what you're asking for is um, how to deal with that. And I think the general population needs to, to kind of learn those skills because it is a time that is difficult for everybody. Everybody. And I also don't think that that is true for us only. It is true for the other side as well. Right? Um, so two hands were up. Um, this young, la young lady in the front, and I think somebody else yes. was as Wesley Curtin, and then we will we'll, we'll have to close on. Yeah. So good evening, everyone. I'm from Santa Rosa Village, Region 1. Good evening. I wish to endorse the gentleman the first part of its, his statement in relation to um, public relations strategy. I think it's very poor um, and I would like to say that there is fear and not concern only in the indigenous communities across Guyana. I just came out of the Pacaraimus, the South Pacaraimus, um, two days ago and uh, on the morning of the 11th there were military planes flying around doing air tactics in our airspace. So it's not like we haven't witnessed, we haven't seen, we're not receiving reports from other areas. There is a community of white water. I would not say what has recently happened, but what is happening and what, what information we're getting is that our people are, are scared, they're, they're afraid that with the Venezuelan army at the border there now, some Venice, some people are moving over the border, over the border, sorry, with criminal backgrounds. We've even received information that they're even as far the, as far as in Georgetown. I'm talking about myself receiving on the ground under the ground grapevine. It could be true, it could be false, but the, these are the information that is coming across. And so our government need to be more alert, they need to assure us, not only those on the borderline, but those even in Georgetown, that what's happening isn't going to have long-term effects on us as well. Um, and I wouldn't just dismiss it as concerns. We have reasons to be afraid. We have reasons to be alert. And like every other Guyanese citizen, indigenous uh, and, and the other ethnic groups, we are, we know ourselves as Guyanese. Even if we're offered ident other identification cards, none of us would, would feel comfortable being ruled by unpredictable a, a, a government. We need that stability, and, and, and um, Mr. Nassiment was saying earlier about the wealth. Was it really? The oil, is that the main issue here? And what are we all as Guyanese benefiting? The heat, the destruction of our environment, is it really the, the threats of an invasion? aggression, and I think we need to really sit down, and I'm, I'm glad you have the academics here as well, because in these times, we really need level-headed people and cool people to take us through and talk us through. And we need people to visit our communities on the borderlines. And the same information that you're spilling out here that Mr. Nascimento said, it's on the website, it's on the internet, most of our communities, all we have is mosquito nets and fish nets. We have poorly connected, installed internet in our... When the, when, the temp, when the cloud is there, you don't get connections. And so we need a robust 
system in place where this information can be on the ground, where it can be spread among the, the communities. And I thoroughly agree with Ms. Rowe's statement. And I would appeal to our indigenous peoples not to leave your villages. You ask a question there, and which I will attempt to answer because people are leaving their communities out of fear. People wouldn't leave just out of concern. And they are financing their own relocations to other families. Some of those people from Matthews Ridge are currently in Georgetown with families. The first set that came out was the younger children and the elder people. Now there's a different set moving out. And people from Yarakita with families as well are moving to other villages within the other communities. And so there is that genuine need for that reassurance, the information that I'm now hearing, all it's widely circulated, it, need, it, it needs to be there, out there in the general public. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think we need to hear it three times. I think this is important. And I think it, whatever the university can do to help circulate what is there, we're working on that as well. We're working on some TikToks, etc. But I know that there's a, a select committee that's working otherwise. So, and Kit is um, part of that. There was one last hand up. Two? Oh, gee. Please be short, <laughs> because we need to get out of here. Uh, one, two, three, and, and then... Yeah. All right, well... Yes. We're going to answer one time. Okay. Kit, Kit that, let's just get the last three, and then you'll remember. Well, you, you've written down your point. Go ahead. Three short ones, guys. We've got to go. Okay. This is going to be very short. Mr. Yeah. Bissemba just made a statement, and he said that the Venezuelans are, that are here are all economic migrants. What assurance do you have to say that they are 100% economic migrants and they're not conscripts among those people? I can answer that. We don't have absolute assurances, but what I do know is that about 80% of the Venezuelans who have come in as a result of this are Guyanese. Guyanese who have gone to Venezuela and are living there and are returning. That's a fact. It's about 80% of them are Guyanese and have as much right to be here as you do. Well, I was born here. I got a right to be here. Well, they were born here or their parents were born here. That's the point. They are Guyanese. They are legit, legitimate Guyanese. We can't throw them out. I haven't finished. As far as I know, almost, not everyone, but almost every one of those who have come in by boat or across the border have been processed by the, by the authorities, all of them. With, with all the poorest borders we have, you were trying to tell me that everyone who came into I didn't say everyone. Oh, I, I said almost. almost. No, there are certainly Venezuelans to come in that we don't know where they are and haven't seen them. But that's very small, believe me. Well, if we had roads, if we were Colombia, and we had roads coming into Guyana, we're fortunate that getting into Guyana from Venezuela ain't easy. I don't know, I don't know where he said um, all of them are economic migrants. I, there's a letter in this topic because I wrote about two weeks ago which said the vast majority. Okay? The determination of somebody as a refugee is a legal process. 
that people like the UNHCR have helped us in the past. Week. And we are under obligation internationally to treat them as migrants. So, so, so if, 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 you, if you know, look, migration moves, there are certain push factors and there are certain pull factors. There has been an outflow of Venezuelans from their borders for about seven or eight years now. I don't know if you remember, about two, three years ago, there was a bridge leading to Colombia. Every day there used to be mass in there. And this is the bubble approach that, that was squeezed in, the people moved somewhere else. And these people are heading, most of them are heading to the US. Eh? It's a long trek that Haitians, Mexicans, uh, Venezuelans are making over foot, over land to get up to the United States of America. Is that is the, that's the pull factor. The US has a far bigger problem than right? we do. So, so um, the few people that are coming that might be refugees, I would say they're very minimal because it's who, who the police, hold on, hold on, let me land, let me land, let me land. The people who would be refugees are like politicians who were opposing Maduro politically and the criteria is that they're fleeing from persecution. And as a result of that, you can't send them back because they would be arrested, jailed, persecuted, tortured, whatever. I'm willing to bet that over the years, the amount of people who are coming here, were coming here. You, talk, you don't talk to Venezuelans who are here, they tell you they're working hard to send money back to their family. Like how we Guyanese decades ago were doing exactly the same thing. Yes, there might be one or two refugees, but it's a criteria. Secondly, there's a humanitarian aspect to this thing, you know. If you've got people coming across your border, in a country that has a low population density, you really are hard pressed to tell them you can't come. And we've reached out to some agencies to help us with resources, training, integration. Now, of late, with this referendum and so on, there's a likelihood that some people might be, s be sent across the border. And I'm assured, I think I saw a statement from the president or the security people, they're doing their work. You're right about the poorest borders. We can't, we can't um, process everybody. But for the majority of people who are coming, I talk to them all the time. They work in stores, restaurants, or whatever. Most of them don't want to hear anything about that gentleman because, in fact, they are fleeing the economic hardship. Not persecution they're fleeing, economic hardship. So there's a fundamental difference. We have a humanitarian obligation to accept our neighbors. I've made the example. During a war, my friend, during a war, if you got two ships, battleships at sea, and one is about to be sunk, you don't leave the enemy combatants to let them drown, you know. You have an obligation to rescue them. That is during a war. We are not at war with anybody now, so why would we not, on a humanitarian basis, take them, especially if we have a large landmass? Beyond a certain point, my friend is going to tell you there's something called managed migration. Right? Beyond a certain point. It's not a charity we're running here. But there are different sides to the correct from a humanitarian side, from an economic side, from a political side. And beyond a certain point, when we reach a saturation point, or if the circumstances change, as apparently they have, now with the current context of the referendum, then of course we step up the security challenges. A lot of those people who come across, they have no identification, you know. Some of them throw it away to, 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 to come across, and then they're undocumented. And if they go by the Venezuelan embassy in town, they can't get a new passport. The Venezuelan embassy might not be willing to help them. So you have people who are almost in a sense of statelessness. That's another, that's another category. So um, yes, the majority are economic migrants. There might be one or two refugees in there, but I'm saying to you, over the passage of time, with the current context now, yeah, there might be some people here, people say about agents or, or um, infiltrators or whatever. I know security people need to do their job, okay? Thank you. Um, last two questions, one and one, two. Let's make it quick. Yeah, I'm not gonna 
question, the percentages being thrown out about how many uh, economic refugees and how many uh, whatever Guyanese coming back. But if it's a two minute swim from one side of the river to the other, and there are only 11 soldiers on the Guyana side, I really don't know how effective the monitoring and the documentation of those that could come across. And that's when it's really have a whole lot of people that can't swim. Then I have to conclude that <laughs> our intelligence might not be as accurate as we are making it out to be. As this gentleman was speaking, I heard a voice at the back. I don't know, it came from a female that asked um, how many, and I thought it was a question, so I'm going to ask it, but I'm going to attribute it to somebody. I don't know who it is. It wasn't original, but I think. How many in the Armenian communities on the border are willing to be trained militarily to help defend Guyana? That was a question that came from someone you have else. An answer? Um, I would say at this time, we, we are not prepared for that. Because this question would have been asked earlier, maybe five years ago, so we need troops from Kaikan. We would say right away, yes, we have some young men here. But at this time, we are ready for that. <laughs> okay. Then. He's, this is an interesting question. Last question on the floor, ladies and gentlemen, goes to the gentleman in the orange and the sh in, in the front. Madam Vice Chancellor, Chancellor, once again, I'd like to commend the University of Ghana for putting on what has tonight been a very spirited um, panel discussion. And I'd like to refer to the last part of the title for tonight, mm -hmm. A Path to Peace. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to first of all commend Mr. Kit Nascimento, who has had a long history in doing excellent work in public relations in this country, and um, who has a very stellar record. Um, however, as a practitioner in communications, I think if the people, your audience, who is supposed to receive your message is saying to you that they're not hearing you, then you ought to listen. I am saying this with the utmost respect for the effort that you've put in, the bumper stickers, the flyers, TikTok, everything. But if you're targeting an audience, then you have to have some measure by which you're determining if it's effective or not. I heard Ms. LaRose made a statement which I had forgotten for years when I was in the army, that people move freely across the border. They move freely across the border. They do not understand or they do not operate in a thinking that says, I'm actually in Venezuela or I'm in Guyana. I think it's to their credit that both Ms. Rose and the gentleman here and the other lady who spoke earlier clearly attest and profess that they're committed to Guyana. But she also said something about the language and I'm happy to hear that we're now gonna do um, flowers in um, five different languages. We need to understand that Guyanese are not a homogenous bunch. These six races, even in the context of regions, people consider coastlanders and those who live in the interior. We have got to be able to tailor our messages to reach to them. And even the gentleman who raises the question about patriotism. Kit, I would suggest that you do a little bit more listening rather than engaging in a combative way because these are the people who we need to reach. And if this forum affords you the opportunity where you're seeing some chinks, 
it is good for your case. Now, I'd like to make some recommendations also. Communications is not only about what you say. It is also about intelligence. It's about gathering information about what is happening. I don't know how much of that we're doing. And again, please, I'm not saying this as if I know more than you do. But I can just pause it based on how I see things are happening. Venezuela still has the initiative. And indeed, like you said, they're the aggressor. So it's easier for them to determine what it is they want to do. We are playing catch up with them. In terms of um, intelligence, the other thing that we need to do also, let me just get my phone on here so you can see my notes. Analytics. If we're doing, and I'm sure in the University of Ghana, people are doing communications, public relations, etc., etc., that is something that we need to do. How effective are we? What, what are the demographics? How are we reaching people? Not only in Guyana, but in the Caribbean. And there's one last point I want to make. Latin America, compared to the Caribbean, is huge. I understand that English is our native language and Spanish is not ours. But we seem to have seeded Latin America, apart from the diplomatic and the diplomatic initiative which we're doing. But we still need to be able to speak to people in Latin America. I'm talking at the basic level, not necessarily the governmental level, which I know we're doing an excellent job with. But we need to speak to Latin Americans so that they understand what is going on. So in the interest of peace, I would urge that we do some more listening. These forums are extremely good. And I think we should consider it a blessing that people would come forward and offer their differences with respect. And I think we should embrace it in that way also. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so is Dr. Gribzandi still here? Or he left? Oh, he's here. Right there. Oh my gosh. Okay, good. So he's going to wrap up, but I just wanted to say, to ask two questions. I want to deal with two things real quick. The idea that we are, everything is against us is not, uh, it's, it should not be perpetuated. We shouldn't think that. If you have, a, you know, military action, etc., we might have, uh, we will have, um, if it's just us against them a numerical disadvantage, maybe. But at this moment, everything is for us with the international case, everything. So that's the first thing. And I want to leave you with a question, especially the gentleman who's a, a communicator and this lady over here who's a behavioral scientist. If a country of what are 16 million people or how many there are, was raised, everyone was raised to believe that this entity, this part of the country, 28 million. 28 million, okay, 28 million. I don't think they still have, I think 6 million left in the last two weeks, but anyway. No, seriously, I'm not kidding, right? But how many left? But if all of these people would have been brought up to believe that this territory is theirs, why do you believe so much energy, so many resources would have been spent within the last few months to convince them to vote for an action which is being proposed? It tells me, from a purely analytical perspective, that too many people are not for this action. They may not, they may believe that the, the claim is, 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 is legitimate, but the course of action may, they have to get a lot of convincing for. That's what it seems like to me. And uh, we have already lost if we are not thinking past and looking at really what is going on there. There are reports coming out that are different from the propaganda that is being perpetuated. 
we are not seeing 20 something million people. We're seeing some particular produced things that are being perpetuated. And it seems to be working on us as well, which any normal thing, but I just want to let us think past to some of what is really going on. That's, that's the one thing. And then I promised that I would read these quick 10 points so that we have a preparedness plan, we'll circulate them. Um, so one, stay informed. Well, we already are saying that we need more information. We need it to be on the ground. We need it, we need it in different, different forms, and we need it to be fast and effective. So we need to do something. With your families, discuss with your family and household members how you will respond to different scenarios. So unfortunately, you have to work through the different scenarios. So if they come over the window, if they, you know, they come through the door, if they come in the night, you know, et cetera. So each family will have to do this by themselves because everybody's, it's not a homogeneous, a homogeneous you know, thing. Everybody has a different. Prefer, prepare an emergency kit. Well, this is always good. Always good, right? Anyway, in other, other uh, anything. If you're, in a, if you're in a place where you have, you cannot get out easily, you have to prepare your routes, different routes of either hiding or escaping or communication. In your case, in, in, in your parts of the, of the country, communication with Georgetown might be difficult. So you have to figure out how you get a chain of communication out so people could know what's happening. Um, secure your homes. Even if people are leaving their homes, try and secure them. Don't leave them so that people can walk in and take them over and take your stuff out, right? Because um, what is interesting about this is everybody's focused on December the 3rd, which is not, you know, the, the, you know, you have to count votes and all kinds of things. But if this is perpetual, if this is something that's happening, it's going to be, this, this fear is going to lead to evacuation, so, and people are doing this. When is it going to stop? Is it that you're planning to leave the area completely forever and ever? Um, at what point are you going to be able to go back, etc.? That may not be a question for you, but it's a thought that you should have, right, in your head. And this is not for only people, anybody, um, for any situation like this. Um, protect yourself from misinformation. There is a disinformation campaign that is working very well about this and that's about the only thing about that <laughs> about that, that that place that is working very well but it is a disinformation campaign and you have to protect yourself from it you have to know it but you have to know the facts and on our side we are we have to do some more about making sure that you have this confirming evidence meaning the things that are factual from our side you need to, we need to know, so that's important. Seek emotional support. As simple as this evening and these events are, it is releasing a safety valve for people to speak and get out some of the things that are concerning them. We now have to figure out what are the practical things that you can do and should do, right? Um, on this piece of paper here, the university is within our, 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 our modest means, offering psychological counseling and so on for people who are really in need of it, including our military. Not that they need it. They're not weak. They're very courageous. But everybody could be stressed, right? We haven't done that yet. But And be aware of your surroundings. Wonderful that you are noticing and paying attention and observing what you are seeing in your environment. Nobody can come from anywhere else and tell you this is not what's happening. So that ground truthing is important for us in town, that we can see what is happening and also help you to and, and, and funnel that information if it's not uh, readily available. So being aware of your surroundings, including who is in those surroundings, and this is not only for people out of town, we've talked about this already. Um, follow instructions. When, if there's a, a chain of command, authorities are there and there you can trust them and you know they're Guyanese and so on, you get instructions to move, move. You know, Guyanese love to argue and say, well, I didn't, this person and tell me and, you know, and then, you know, something happened. So 
be very alert and be quick to follow instructions if you have them and they're clear, and help others. In these conditions, we have to help one another. Um, and helping somebody does not necessarily only mean we might have to take some people into our homes temporarily. We might have to take them into some churches temporarily. We might have to offer food. We might have to offer counseling. We might have to do things. Um, it doesn't only mean physical and financial things. It might mean just giving them a direction or calling them up and seeing how they're doing. Because especially when people are anxious, lack of information and lack of being able to, to connect with other people also fuels that, right? Um, stay hopeful. Find something to do. Pay attention, but don't focus on this 100%, 1,000%, and leave everything else in your life. Because this is not something that is likely to go away tomorrow, right? The, um, this kind of problem has existed for a long time, although it has not escalated to this thing. So if you hang your life up and say, I'm going to wait until they're finished doing whatever they're doing, until I continue my program, until I bake my cake, until I have my birthday for my colleagues or my friend or my family, it steals something from you. And since we don't know, it doesn't have a finite end, it could lead you into hopelessness, depression, etc. So do the things that you need to do, but do it with care. Stay healthy. Very important if you have to run away, fight somebody, etc. Very important to stay healthy, mentally and otherwise. Manage your money and your resources very well because you don't know, you know if you have to stretch them and what you'll have to do. So those are the, some, some practical things that we can do. And for each person, it's going to be different. But at least it sets us on a path of thinking about how we begin to prepare for something, right? And those of us in Georgetown, please do not feel that people in Georgetown are also not concerned or fearful or anxious. We are, you are part of us. And the fact that we cannot pick up ourselves and come and do something for you bothers me. And I think it bothers everybody else in here. But there are people preparing to do that. They are. I can't speak for the military. It's not my job. But they are, they are not sitting on their hands. So that's my two cents. And now I can hand over to... The registrar to close and give the, 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 the um, thanks. But I want to thank you all for staying this long. You really have a lot of uh, energy. And the panel, registrar. Thank you kindly, Vice Chancellor. Allow me this evening, from the very onset, to commend our own Vice Chancellor and the University of Ghana for organizing and hosting this second in a series of Turkine and Teen Talks on the Venezuela-Ghana territorial issue under the theme, Prepare Rather Than Fear. Indeed, the University of Ghana, through tonight's conversation, is executing a mandate that was established by an act of parliament, formerly the Legislative Assembly, then British Guyana, some 60 years ago, on April 19th, 1963, when the University of Guyana was established. Upon its establishment, they are clearly requested of it in section 4 the requirement of and I'm quoting now from the act providing a place for education learning research was standard required and expected of a university of the highest standard to secure the advancement of knowledge the diffusion and extension of arts, sciences, and learning throughout Guyana. To that mission, 
was tonight's conversation on the venezuela Guyana territorial controversy solidly anchored. The scholarship and applied experiences coming from our esteemed panel, to be December, Kit Nascimento, Kevin Jeffrey, Brandon Chung, Mrs. Sion Hema, but some very instructive questions coming from you, members of the audience, and those online, allowed us to understand how important and necessary this issue is for all of us. The moment the Vice Chancellor asked me two nights ago to do the sum up and the vote of thanks, I immediately went on a scan to see what was being said about this issue among Guyanese various centers. And I want to use the opportunity of tonight's wrap up to speak to some of these issues as reflected in the regional media within CARICOM and those in North America, specifically Canada and the US and in the UK. Guyanese in the diaspora are seeing what is happening now largely as a provocative move by the president of Venezuela to have a referendum that calls for, among other things, possible intervention and annexation of the Esikubu region in Guyana. Concerns have been expressed by Amerindian communities in Dominica that the mock referendum already held on Sunday, November 19th 2023 sends a clear and compelling message for the intensification of education of our peoples and information. In the UK, columnists have reported that the unprecedented level of aggression and statements coming out of Caracas must be taken seriously as these come against the backdrop of, quote, bullyism pursued over several decades by Venezuela. A call has been made in Canada for the interrogation of the security and geopolitical considerations that Diana must consider since the, 1980, since the 1899 award had implications not only for agreed to boundaries between Ghana and Venezuela, but also Brazil, and any changing of borders would have implications for Brazil's borders. In the United States, in the Queens, New York area, reports coming out over the last 48 hours expressed concern about possible destabilization of the population inside Guyana with precipitation of movement of Guyanese out of areas such as Mabaruma and Morocco. And what are the implications of this? That came out through the exchanges of questions tonight. And there was a call at four centers echoed again tonight that Ghana needs to monitor closely conversations involving the resuscitation of the petro caribbean agreement between Venezuela and particularly OECS countries, St. Vincent's inclusive Grenada, Barbados, and that Maduro, since the easing of sanctions is perceived in some quarters to engage selected CARICOM leaders to change their posture towards open and unencumbered solidarity with Diana 
this has the potential to create, if not manage property, properly, a fractured CARICOM. And that Diana's response must be, in the Bronx, a call for an urgent meeting of CARICOM heads where CARICOM is headquarters in Georgetown yes. so as to show CARICOM's collective and individual solidarity yes. and support. These are the messages emerging over the last 24 hours yes. and I share it. In concluding, I believe that a special commendation must be extended to the director and head of the DEC and PACE respectively of the University of Guyana's departments. These teams have worked remarkably hard from profound discipline and commitment of their service to the university and by extension, the Guyanese society. To the number of academic and administrative staff who were provided the Vice Chancellor team behind the scenes support not known and visible. We want to say thanks to them as they contribute to the national broader conversation. <laughs> and finally, Vice Chancellor, your own tone of setting today's conversation, asking us to reflect directly and to speak our conversations coherently to our brothers and sisters in Venezuela resonates with our brothers and sisters in the diaspora. Reminding us of the land we had prior to 1600 is very instructive for me as a student of history and the role, the concept of effective occupation led to the 83,000 square miles of territory that we now have. I believe that the cost of conflict is priceless. Let us as our theme today says prepare rather than fear. The University of Ghana invites us all to prepare and to use the opportunity to monitor that which is happening. Thanks and God bless.